So, um, so before I get started, um, I thought I'd take the opportunity to plug my book very shortly. Um, so, so yeah, so um, you can visualize mathematics with uh, 3D printing. So um, it's a popular math book. It should be accessible to um, everybody, hopefully. Um, and the, the thing that's a little bit different about this um, is that it's all about 3D printing. So, well, it's, it's illustrated with 3D print. So there's a website, 3dprintmath.com. And on the website, you can go through and you can look at there's each of the, the images, the figures in the book, there's a page for each of these. So here's, here's figure 2.9. And so it's, well, I don't actually have the 3D prints with me, but you can go to the website and you can sort of load up a 3D model that you can zoom into and, and explore around. Or you can download the models and print them out yourself or, or whatever you want to do. And somehow the idea is that if you're talking about 3D ideas, you should have three-dimensional figures. Right? Why does the, te the biology textbook not come with a model of DNA um, or the shape of the heart? Right? If, you're, if you're trying to explain 3D images, you should have 3D figures. Okay, uh, on with the talk. So, so I'm going to try and tell you about um, how to see some things in four-dimensional space. But before we get into that, what is four-dimensional space? Um, and Despite this being Saturday morning physics, I'm not a physicist, I'm a mathematician. If I were a physicist, maybe I'd think of time as the fourth dimension, but I'm going to think of another spatial dimension. So I've got four perpendicular directions somehow that I can move in. So, so let's um, make sure we're all on the same page and understand this. So, so let's go back to, to, to basics. Um, what about two-dimensional space? How do you talk about points in the two-dimensional plane? So you can specify the location of a point with two numbers. So x and y, say. And so I've got a point up there uh, that's three along and, and two up. So I need two numbers to talk about a point in two dimensions. And if I want to talk about a point in three dimensions, let's get rid of those lines and those numbers, then I need a, a third direction. So I have a z axis. And then I can talk about points in three dimensional space with three numbers. And so I just need to uh, have another axis that's at right angles to the other two. And if I want to talk about points in four-dimensional space, I just add an extra direction that's at right angles to the other three that I've already got, and I talk about four different numbers to talk about a point. Um, now, usually at this point, people are a little unhappy with me. <laughs> because they say, you know, like, like, what is this thing here, right? <laughs> what direction is that pointing in? That's not at right angles to those three other things. There's no way you can do that. But nobody complained when I was here. Right? <laughs> this, this line is not at right angles to this line. It's at, I don't know, 45 degrees or something. Right? Even though I drew this sort of sharp thing here that's supposed to make you think that there's a right angle there, it's not. It's, it's flat on the screen. It's 45 degrees. Um, and the only reason we're OK with this picture is because we're evolved in a three-dimensional world. And we, we're very familiar with you know, these two-dimensional pictures that are supposed to be showing us these three-dimensional things, even though this is not three-dimensional in the slightest. It's on, on a screen. So what you, what you did is like you said, oh, I recognize what you did here. You squished a three-dimensional thing flat down onto the screen, and then I understand how to unsquish it in my mind and interpret it. So I just squish a four-dimensional thing <laughs> down onto the screen. And if you were OK with the previous one, you should be fine with this as well. <laughs> Well, OK, um, and really that's, that's sort of what the story of this is about, is how do you, you know, try and unsquish pictures that are, came from a higher dimension and got squished into a lower dimension, then you try and understand what the unsquished thing was. OK, so, so, so that's four-dimensional space. Um, let's, let's have an example object to think about um, so we can try and start thinking about visualizing this object. So I'm going to make a hypercube, a four-dimensional version of a cube. So I'm going to start out very simple. I've got uh, two, two points here. Well, actually, just one point. And I'm going to move a copy of that point over, over here and then connect up the, uh, the, the two points, and I get a line segment. Okay. 
And then I'll do it again. So I've got a line segment. I'm going to move it over. This is moving in a, a direction perpendicular to the line that the line segment is inside of. Uh, and then I get these two line segments. I connect up the corners. I get a square. Let's do it again. So I got a square, and I move it perpendicular to the plane that this square is in. And here I'm cheating again, right? Because I'm not actually doing that. I've just shifted it sideways on the screen. But OK, we're fine. We're fine with this. So I've got this sh thing shifted over here, and I connect to the corners, and I make a cube. And I'll do it one more time. Take a cube, move. We'll take a copy, and I shift it at right angles to the three-dimensional space that that cube is in somehow, connect up the corners, and this is some sort of picture of a hypercube. So, so you can get some sort of idea of what's going on here, and you, and you can see some, some patterns here. So, uh, so for example, you can count how many corners does a hypercube have. Right, so a square has four corners, and a cube has eight corners. It doubles every time. And this hypercube has 16 corners. You can go through and, and count them. And actually, the line segment has two corners, so 2, 4, 8, 16. It's doubling every time. You can also count how many sides it has. So, so a square has four sides, each of which is a line segment. And a cube has six sides, each of which is a square. And a hypercube has eight sides. It's a different sequence going uh, four, six, eight. Uh, so the eight sides of this are all cubes. So you can sort of see there's a cube over here. And there's a cube over here, and there's also these, I don't know if you can see this sort of elongated cube here. So, so actually, this has two sides as well. Each side of the line segment is a point. So 2, 4, 6, 8. And you can imagine how that continues onwards. OK, so you can see something about this, but it's not really telling you. I mean, this is sort of more combinatorial. How, how do things fit together? How many are there? It's not really telling you geometry. So OK, how do we do better than this? Um, so. How can you see things in four-dimensional space? Um, unfortunately, you can't. It's not possible. Um, there, there are some people who claim that they can see in four-dimensional space, and I think they're probably lying or mistaken. Um, I've met some of them, and well, I don't know. So uh, may, maybe you can gain some sort of intuition. But as I say, I mean, we're just not evolved to deal with this. So it'd be surprising if we could. Um, so, so how do we get some sense? So there's a few different ways, and, and this is the, the way that I'm going to talk about, um, is, is looking at shadows of things projected from one dimension down to a lower dimension. So this picture here, I've got a cube. Um, so this is, this is projecting from three dimensions down to two dimensions. So I've got this three-dimensional cube here, and it's sitting on a, uh, like a, a, a sheet of uh, transparent plastic that's held up above the, the table. And I, I've got my light is somewhere up up in the corner here, and it's projecting down uh, a shadow like this. And so the idea is that maybe you have a two-dimensional friend who's living in the, the table here, and you're trying to show your two-dimensional friend what a cube is. Um, and so your two-dimensional friend is, is enti lives entirely in the table, can't see up above it, but, uh, but they can you know, sense this shadow somehow. Um, and they can, say, they can see various things about this. So, so this is actually. Um, this is actually uh, an example of uh, parallel projection. This is a particular kind of projection from a higher dimensional thing to a lower dimensional thing. It's called parallel projection because the light rays that come in towards the, the cube are parallel to each other. Um, and so we'll go through uh, a couple of other things, of, ways of doing this. Um, so, so, OK, so our two-dimensional friend may you know, look at this shadow and say, OK, so I can see there's an edge over here. And there's n, then there's another edge over here, and those are parallel, right? And you'd say, yes, yes, those are really parallel in the real three-dimensional object. And, and so that's a, a true fact about this, this cube that you can tell from the shadow. And they may also say, oh, and I see this edge here and this edge here, they collide with each other. They go through each other. And you say, ah, well, no, not, that's not actually what's going on. Sorry, yeah. Um, and so you can see up here the reason that that's happening. I think it's this edge here. The shadow is being cast down here. And it crashes over this edge here. And so that's why you see those two edges colliding. So that's, that's, a, you know, that's a problem with the projection. It's not telling you something that's real. Um, but you, know, you have to sort of distort things. So OK, fine. Um, well, if you do this one dimension up, and you have a, a four-dimensional friend who uh, has a hypercube, and, and you cast a shadow from four dimensions down into a three-dimensional table we're living on the table, um, then this is what you get. Or this is, this is an example. So I'm going to hand a whole bunch of things around. So 
I guess I'll start with, with you and they'll, they'll make their way around the room and hopefully out into the overflow theater and everything. So, so this, is, um, this is a sculpture, um, a 3D printed sculpture called Hypercube B by uh, Bathsheba Grossman, who's really one of the, the pioneers in 3D printed mathematical artwork. And so, I mean, you can see there's a lot of similarities between this picture and this picture. Um, so there's a lots of parallel lines just as there are parallel lines. And so we can look at this and say, oh, so it looks like this edge here is parallel to this edge here. Is that really true? And yes, that's really true in the four-dimensional hypercube. Um, and let's see. So we don't see any edges that are actually colliding with each other, but there's still some sort of collision here. So, um, so this edge going down through here uh, is actually going through. There's a sort of a square. Well, it should be square, but actually it's a rhombus or a parallelogram or something. But yeah, so there's this... There's this square here and the edge going through here, and those don't actually crash through each other in the real four-dimensional object. This is just a problem with the projection. Same sort of deal as we had before. Okay, so, so that's one sort of better picture of a four-dimensional hypercube. Um, so what if I want to fix this problem of things crashing into each other? And it will become important later on that I don't have uh, that sort of problem happening. So, so what I can do is I can move the light closer. So rather than a parallel projection, this is a perspective projection of a cube. So here I've got my light source is uh, here quite close to the cube. And then you can see that um, the shadow has changed a little bit. Um, and I guess there's an interesting thing here to think about. I won't tell you why this is true. This looks like a perspective drawing of a cube. Right? Why is it that the shadow looks like a perspective drawing? So a little puzzle to think about. But OK, but in terms of how do I fix my picture, this isn't really helping. I've still got collisions between edges, and now I don't even have parallel edges, right? So this edge and this edge are not parallel, even though in the real object they are parallel. But I can improve things. So, so here's a, a, a different way to do this. So rather than having the light sort of off to the side, I'm going to put it directly above a square face of the cube. And then you'll notice that, I, well, so I still don't have this parallel property anymore. That's gone forever. But none of my edges are crashing into each other. And so I've removed that kind of collision, um, which is good. It's making a clearer picture of, of how things are arranged, which is going to be better for my two-dimensional friend. Now, I haven't entirely removed the crashing. Um, so there are no edges that are colliding with each other. But where are the six square faces of the cube in the shadow? So, so the bottom face, the bottom square here, that's going to be this smaller square here, because it's further away from the light source. Right? And then the four, uh, the four faces on the sides of the cube, they're going to map down to these um, trapezoid shapes. I always get confused because they're called tra trapeziums in England. and Trapezoids, in, anyway, it's very confusing. Um, where does the top face of the cube go? Inside, outside? Outside? It doesn't actually go outside. That's coming up later. So, OK, so, so let's trace this. So, so here's this light, and here's a corner of this square. And if I had a straight line thing, then it would go down to here. So, so this corner is definitely going there, and this corner is going there. So, so the four corners of this top face are going to these four corners here. And so there's like a pyramid here, if you imagine the rays of light. And the top square goes, and it covers all five others. So there's no edges colliding with each other but the top square is covering all of the other five. So there, there's still quite a lot of collision going on. Um, but OK, so if we do this again one dimension up, you are four-dimensional friend. I, I don't know if you have a four-dimensional friend, but, uh, but our four-dimensional friend casts a shadow of this hypercube that they happen to have lying around down into our three-dimensional table, and this is the shadow that you see. So uh, maybe I should start over here so we can sort of we'll figure it out. And again, this is another one by uh, Bathsheba Grossman. And you can really see there's a similarity here. So there's, there's a thing in the middle, just like there was over here. There was the, the, the bottom face, the bottom side of the cube was here. Here's the bottom side of the hypercube. There's a cube here that's in the middle. It's the smallest because it's furthest away from the four-dimensional light source that our friend has. And then there are these, uh, what are these things called? So they're not trapeziums and they're not trapezoids. Uh, there's sort of truncated pyramids, frustrums sometimes they're called. Um, there's one on the front here, and then, well, there's four around the outsides, and then one on the bottom, one on the top, so that's six. And I told you there were eight 
cubical sides of the hypercube, and there's one more, the top one, and just as in the, the case going from three dimensions to two dimensions, the top cube covers the other seven. So similar sort of deal. Okay. So how can we fix this? How can we um, avoid all of these kinds of uh, crashings? And so if I could get the, the lights down just for a second. Spotlight. Somebody turn that spotlight off because this isn't going to work with it. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Okay, so, so, so I'm going to tell you, well, something called stereographic projection. So here's a, a demonstration of that. So I've got um, a sort of sphere here with some sort of curvy markings on it. And I've got a flashlight here. And it's got a nice little point light source. And so if I put the light um, in exactly the right place, then the, uh, this curvy grid turns into a nice, perfectly regular grid. So, okay, so get the lights back on again. So here's an easier to see picture of that. So, so stereographic projection is a way of mapping from a sphere to the plane. So, so I've got this light source up here, and light rays come down and they hit the sphere somewhere, and then they carry on and they hit the plane somewhere, and the map is from the sphere to the plane is just where does it hit on the sphere to where does it hit on the plane. And it's actually a very simple mathematical formula for what this transformation is, but the physical interpretation is so uh, so pretty that you know you don't really need to to know the the formula the, the formula to to understand what it's doing. Um, I should mention um, so this wasn't an easy photograph to take, right? I mean, you saw as I was moving it, so you know a l tiny little motion in the light source makes a big change in what the shadow looks like. So how did I take this photograph? You know, I'm holding the light like this, and I've somehow got my other finger on the shutter of the the camera. Well, so actually, um, this is behind the scenes. So what's actually happening is that this, the light is hanging from a rod, and there's a cross beam and a couple of clamp stands. And the hand is purely decorative. <laughs> it's just, it's not doing anything. It's just sort of sitting there, um, trying not to move the thing. So anyway, so that, that's how I took this photograph. Um, OK, so, so, so this maps from the sphere to the plane. So I want to use this. Oh, and let me explain, a, 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 just mention a couple of other things. So, so this grid is a, it's a 6 by 6 grid is what I've drawn. But you can imagine that this keeps going out on the plane forever and ever, right? Get, getting small, well, staying the same size but getting further and further away. And then the grid on the sphere would have to get smaller and smaller and smaller as you go towards the top. Right? So actually what's happening is that every point of the sphere, um, other than the North Pole itself, goes down to some point on the plane. So this is something we'll come back to uh, a few more times, is the sphere is the same as the plane, topologically, plus one extra point. The north pole of the sphere itself doesn't, doesn't go down to any, any point down on the plane. OK, so how am I going to use this to make a picture of a cube for my two-dimensional friend? So this is a little difficult to understand this picture, unfortunately. Um, but so what I've got is I've got my cube in here, and I've got a light source that's at the center of the cube. And then it's projecting out onto a sort of spherical shell. So actually, it's, um, this is, this is uh, the spherical shell and sort of the, the, the shadow of this cube on the outside. So here's a, here's a sort of schematic picture. I've got a cube in here inscribed inside of a sphere, and I kind of blow it up to make a beach ball cube that's now on the sphere. So this is the image of the cube on the sphere. And then I can stereographically project that down onto the plane. So now it's on a sphere. I can move it to the plane. I guess I'll hand this around as well. So OK. Um, well, we don't even have straight lines now, um, sure. Um, you're saying this is a cube? Yes, I'm saying it's a cube. And I, and I think it's the best picture of a cube. Um, I mean, I have my reasons. Um, but again, so, so where are these? OK, so, so, so let me try and convince you why this is, this is uh, well, it's fixing my problem. That's, what I, that's, what I, that's why I like this one. So, so here's the square on the bottom. I've got my four squares around the outside, a little bit curvy, but whatever. So the side squares go here. Where does the top square go? So this time, if you trace a, a ray of light from the top, uh, from the, the, the North Pole, where the, the flashlight is, and suppose it goes out, so it goes into the sphere and then out again, sort of just above this point here, then it continues out when it's, and it hits here. So the top face goes outside of everything else, and there's no crashing at all. All of the points on the sphere, all of the faces of the cube get their own places out on the plane. So it's a one-to-one it's a -one map. It's bijective. 
OK, there's another view. And if you do this one dimension up, uh, then you get this kind of picture as a sort of curvy stereographic projection of a hypercube, um, which admittedly looks sort of similar to the previous one. Um, but as I say, there's these advantages that it's a it's a one-to-one -one map. There's no crashing at all. Um, here's a here's a sort of computer rendered uh, version of this, which includes the the square faces between the hypercubes. Uh, unfortunately, the 3D printing technology isn't good enough yet to be able to do you know. You've got your solid edges, and then you've got a semi-translucent uh, uh, faces. Uh, get it together, engineering people, because I want to print this. <laughs> um, but you, so, so you can see it here. There's, there's the cube in the middle. There's the, the seven sort of distorted cubes around the outside. And then the eighth cube is outside of all of the other ones. So just as it was um, back here, the, the top face is outside of everything. Here, the top cube, the top side of this Hypercube is outside of everything, and we're inside of it. It takes up the rest of the universe. OK. So um, I just wanted to mention a, a, a couple of other amazing things about stereographic projection. Um, so it preserves angles. So uh, here are some other designs with other pretty things that you can do. So, so this, uh, this square grid here on the, on the plane, the, the lines meet at right angles, of course. They also meet at right angles on the, on the surface. Maybe I'll hand this one, one around as well. But yeah, you, you can check that all of the all of the arcs of these are arcs of circles actually, and they all meet at right angles as well. And so it preserves angles, meaning by which I mean that um, two thing two two vectors that are meeting on the sphere at some angle, their shadows also meet at the same angle. Um, okay, so I skipped over something kind of quickly a while back. Uh, that's that was when I was going here. I said let's do the same thing one dimension up, and we get that. So. What was that process? Let's just go back and be a little bit careful about what happened. So how did I make this picture on the plane? I started with the cube. It was back here. Whoops, cube. And then I radially projected onto the sphere. And then I stereographically projected from the sphere to the plane. So let's just take a minute to say, OK, what, what's that thing in the middle? You start with a hypercube. And I radially projected onto the sphere in four-dimensional space. And then I stereographically project from the sphere in four-dimensional space to our three-dimensional world. So OK, what is that sphere? What is a sphere? So a sphere is a set of points that are some fixed distance from a center. So, so it sort of depends on what my space I'm living in is. So, so if, if my space is the two-dimensional plane, then a sphere is actually a circle. Right? It's the set of points at some distance from the center. So OK. Um, so the sphere in three-dimensional space is, here's another picture, another stereographic projection, and it's the usual sphere uh, that we're familiar with. And I've been arguing that it's sort of the same as the two-dimensional plane plus one point at infinity. So the, the north pole corresponds to points that are, all the points that are sort of infinitely far away from, from the center here. And I, I, so I've put some sort of landmarks on the sphere here to help us understand what's going on. So I've got an equator on this sphere and a couple of lines of longitude. And these cut the sphere up into these eight triangular uh, octants, I guess. So there's, there's four triangles in the southern hemisphere and four triangles in the northern hemisphere. And I want, I want you to look at the, the shadow here. So the southern hemisphere here has four triangles. I mean, they're a little bit bendy, but whatever. They're triangles. Um, and then there's these regions out here, which are harder to imagine that they're triangles, but they really are, right? I mean, if you, you, know, you look back on the, the three-dimensional sphere up here, um, you know, this triangle and that triangle are obviously the same objects. It's just that their shadows are sort of different because of the distortion of the projection. But they're really the same. It's sort of stretched out, but it's really the same sort of thing as this thing in the southern hemisphere. OK, so now, the sphere in four-dimensional space I can't show you it, because it's in four dimensions. All I can do is I can show you the shadow. But in exactly the same way, it's the same as three-dimensional space plus a point that's sort of infinitely far away. And I've, I've drawn a sort of similar sort of landmarks in here. So this is the shadow. Um, so over here, the equator was a sphere one dimension down, otherwise known as the circle. Here in the sphere in four-dimensional space, this, the equator is a sphere one dimension down is the usual sphere in three-dimensional space. 
So this is the equator. The southern hyperhemisphere is inside of here. So over here, the southern hemisphere is this two-dimensional disk. And over here, the southern hyperhemisphere is a three-dimensional ball. And over here, it had four triangles in it. And over here, it has eight tetrahedra, right, these uh, four-sided shapes with four triangles. So there's eight of those in the southern hyperhemisphere. And then there's eight more in the northern hyperhemisphere. Um, so unlike these ones over here, these are sort of stretched out, but they're really the same as these ones here. And over here, there's these really stretched out tetrahedra that somehow go out to infinity. Um, but they're really the same as the ones in, inside for exactly the same reason as they're the same over here. OK, so maybe that's given you some sense of what this, what this sphere is. It's really just the same as three-dimensional space plus an extra point. OK, uh, let's switch gears for a little bit and uh, talk about some uh, regular polygons. And this will generalize to polyhedra. And, and the general thing is sort of symmetrical shapes are called polytopes. Um, so we can draw more things in four dimensions. So, so in two dimensions, we have the, the regular polygons. We're all very familiar with these. Uh, triangle, the square, the pentagon, and so on. So in three dimensions, the equivalent regular symmetrical objects are the platonic solids or the regular polyhedra. So uh, you may be familiar with these, with these from Dungeons & Dragons dice. Um, so you've got your four-sided die. So here's another picture of a tetrahedron, a cube, octahedron, dodecahedron, and icosahedron. So you might ask, what happens in four dimensions or five dimensions? What, you know, how do these things live in the different dimensions? So there's an actually an, an interesting thing that goes on. So, so here's this infinite family of regular polygons. There's infinitely many in two dimensions. In three dimensions, there's only five, which is sort of weird. Um, there are actually three other infinite families, but they don't live in a single dimension like the polygons do in two dimensions. They jump between dimensions. So, so here's one of the families. We all, we've already seen it. This is the point, line segment, square, cube, hypercube, and so on. And that keeps going. Right? You just To go from the hypercube up to the five-dimensional hypercube, you take a copy, you move it across, you connect with the corners, you keep going. Uh, here's a couple of other ones. So this one, um, they all look the same in dimensions 0 and 1, but the construction is different. So this top one, to get the next one in the sequence, you take one extra point that's off the thing that you've already got. So in this case, you, you make one extra point off the line segment, connect up, and you get a triangle. And then I make one extra point that's off the plane that the triangle is inside of, connect it up, and I get a tetrahedron. And then you get something called the five cell, and this continues on forever. And this one is the same sort of thing, except you're adding two points off of the thing that you already had. So line segment, add two points, you make a diamond, otherwise it's known as a square. And then you've got your, your square, you add two points, you make an octahedron, and, and so on. So there's these four beautiful infinite families. And you may have noticed the, uh, the dodecahedron and the icosahedron weren't in there. They don't fit into that pattern. These are the only exceptions to those patterns. So there's the dodecahedron and the icosahedron in three dimensions. There's the 24 cell, the 120 cell, and the 600 cell in four dimensions. And then there's nothing else beyond that in any higher dimension. So in five dimensions, six dimensions, everything else, you just have the version of the the tetrahedron, the cube, and the octahedron. That's it. And so these things are really weird, right? They don't fit into these nice patterns. I mean, if you want to annoy a mathematician, ask them, why does the dodecahedron exist? <laughs> right? The cube exists. It's like really easy. Well, you just do this, you know, copying, making, you know, you're just sliding things around. The dodecahedron, there's no such, it's a much more complicated reason why this thing exists. Um, Icosahedron is, is closely related to the dodecahedron. Uh, the 24th, incidentally, the, uh, the names of the four-dimensional uh, polytopes is the same sort of thing as the names of the three-dimensional ones. So dodecahedron, dodec means 12, and hedron means face, right? It's the thing with 12 faces. Uh, for these four-dimensional things, you don't get faces. You get cells, like the cells in a, in a honeycomb, or, or biological cells. They're three-dimensional things that kind of fit together. So the 24 cell has 24 octahedral cells. The 120 cell has 120 dodecahedral cells. It's sort of the four-dimensional version of the dodecahedron. The 600 cell has 600 tetrahedral cells. It's somehow the four-dimensional version of the uh, icosahedron. And the 24 cell is just weird. It's not like anything else. Um, these are renders rather than prints because they'd be huge and expensive and wouldn't fit in the printer. So instead, here is, I've got one of them here. This is half of it. 
So this is the half of the 120 cell in the southern hyperhemisphere. So I'll hand that around as well. Um, so remember that the equator is, a, is an ordinary sphere, so you cut it off and you take the thing that's inside and you get um, this thing here. Um, OK, so, so I wanted to tell you about a couple of projects of visualizing things and making things that come from the fourth dimension. So I'm going to start with the first project. It's called Puzzling the 120 Cell, which is a joint work with uh, my collaborator, Saul Schleimer. He's at the University of Warwick. Um, and so, oh, and incidentally, the, you know, these pictures are made in exactly the same way as I made my favorite picture of a hypercube. It's radial projection onto the sphere in four-dimensional space and then stereographic projection to our three-dimensional world. So we wanted to understand this thing because it's super complicated. Like, what is going on in here? So it's got 120 dodecahedral cells. And um, so any two neighboring dodecahedral cells, there's a pentagon in between them, and there's 720 of those, 1,200 edges, and 600 vertices. So this is a complicated object. So how can we sort of begin to understand what's going on with it? So, so one way to do this is sort of to build spherical layers outward. So, so if you've got the 3D print there, in the very center of it, there's a single dodecahedral cell. So here's a picture of it. So one central dodecahedron in the middle. This is kind of schematic picture. I've got the light at the north pole of my sphere in four-dimensional space. And there's one cell that's right at the bottom. Just like way back here. Whoops, there we go. There's one square in the bottom arranged around the southern, hem the southern the south pole of the sphere. So same sort of thing. So there we go. So there's one there. Arranged around that, there are 12 dodecahedra that are glued onto it. Um, and they're a fifth of the way up towards the North Pole. And then there's 20 more a third of the way up uh, that are glued to these orange ones that are a fifth of the way up. Another 12, uh, two fifths of the way up. And 30 when you get up to half of the way up. So that's the equator again. I'm building outwards and building these chunks together. Um, and then it sort of repeats in the, the last four layers. So, and I didn't draw that in because it gets kind of crazy because they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so the, the pattern sort of mirrors. And if you add up all of these, you do indeed get 120. That is indeed half of the 120 cell. Here's another thing you can do. Um, so you can make these rings of, 12, uh, of 10 dodecahedra. So what do you do? So I start here in a dodecahedron. And I decide on a, a, a way to go. Actually, maybe. A good thing to think about is, is uh, what's this, this making a ring of squares on a cube? Right? So I start in one of the squares on, the, on my cube, and I decide a direction to go, and I go that direction, and I go into the next door square. And then I keep going straight out the other side, and I get to the next door square, and the next one, and I'll make a ring of four squares if I do this. So the same thing here. I start in a dodecahedron. I go out of one of the faces of the dodecahedron into the next door one, and then I go straight through the dodecahedron out the other side, and I keep going. And you get back to where you started after visiting 10 dodecahedra. OK. Uh, I mean, you have to, there's only 120 of them. You have to get back to where you started somehow, and it turns out it takes you 10 to do this. If you do the same thing started out, starting out in a next door neighboring dodecahedra, and you kind of go the same way, you get another ring that wraps around the first. Um, and so you can keep going. So each of these rings, so here's this, the ring I started with, and I've, got, I've drawn four of them in here. There's another one that goes in here. So there's sort of like a, a Death Star trench in here. So, so there's these five rings surrounding that central one. And that's half of my 120 cell, because I have six rings, each of which have 10 dodecahedra. Six times 10 is 60. OK, so that's six rings. There's the seventh ring. It wraps around all of these rings, the eighth, the ninth, the tenth, the eleventh. And as usual, we're inside of the 12th thing. We're inside of the biggest one. OK, so we wanted to 3D print maybe not all of them, because it would fill the universe with plastic. But, <laughs> but let's just do the ones, you know, the central one and the, and the five ones that wrap around it. And there's a problem. If you stick this in the printer, um, like, arranged like it is there, then it will come out fused as a single object, um, because they're touching each other and you're melting plastic or whatever it is you're doing. Um, but we wanted them to be loose so we could see how they fit together. And so what we had to do is somehow try and arrange them in space so that they're not touching each other. So, and we could only manage to do like the central ring and then two others. 
Uh, it didn't seem to be possible to fit in a third one at all. Um, but OK, so, so we did this. And here it is. So it's, so, it's sort of like a, a four-dimensional baby's rattle. Um, so, and you can try and sort of see how they, they fit together. Um, well, so maybe I'll hand this around. Um, so, so there it is. You can you just sort of see it. There it is when it's all, it's got the central ring, and then there's two, two around it, and then it sort of breaks apart a little bit like that. Um, but we really wanted to do all five. So, so we cheated. Um, I mean, the problem, the problem is that you have to sort of arrange them apart from each other, and, but because they're linked, you can't just sort of print them completely separately. Um, but we could print them completely separately if we sort of remove those biggest four ones on the outside. So if we just have these six, um, then I can just print them separately, and, it's, and I don't have to worry about them being linked together, and so there's no problem. Um, so this is a sort of gently curving um, collection of dodecahedra, so we call it a rib, because ribs are gently curving and made out of dodecahedra. Um, so, okay, so two, three, four, five. Let me actually get rid of the ring in the middle, because I don't really need it. Um, and we'd sort of inadvertently made a puzzle, because what happens is they come out of the printer like this, and then you have to fit them together again. So, uh, so this, is, this is the puzzle. So it's not a single solid object. It breaks apart into pieces, and then the puzzle is to put them back together again. So let's try and do this live on stage in front of however many hundred people. It was dangerous, but I've got pretty good at it. Or hopefully. Oh, no. No, no. Oh, phew, there we go. So, uh, so I'll hand that around. If you break it, then um, you have to put it back together again. I have to break it apart to put it in my luggage anyway, so it's not a big deal. Um, let's see, so here's another way to cut it up. So, so he, I've got a, a, a straight line of these dodecahedra we call a rib. Um, and there's two, three, four, five, six. So, so I've got five of these sort of shorter curving things around here and another five around there. And I end up with this um, puzzle we call, well, so, so we somehow name these after space things. That was a ring, as in the rings of Saturn, and this is a meteor, I don't know, whatever. These 11 things here fit together to make this thing that has dodecahedral <laughs> symmetry. So, um, so we, so we sort of ended up deciding on these six different kinds of, of rib. There's the straight one, which is the spine. And then there were curving ones of different uh, kinds of curvature. Um, and they go together to make, we were really surprised at how many different uh, kinds of um, construction you can make with these. It's sort of Lego for, um, for objects in, in the sphere in four-dimensional space. Um, so here's a puzzle for you. Uh, two of these are photographs of the same thing seen from different directions. <laughs> Which two? I'll take one guess, because it's essentially impossible. <laughs> Anybody willing? Yeah. Row, two, row three, position three, and row three, position four? Uh, sorry, no, they're different. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, you, well, you can sort of see, actually, this one has a hole through it, and that one doesn't. This is basically impossible. I, I've given this talk a number of times, and I think we're now at statistical significance. Like, it's just completely random. I think one person has, has there's actually two pairs. Uh, I lied. This is the same as this, and this one is the same as this one. It really doesn't look like it, but I can, whoops. We're getting onto that soon. So, so well, so this is uh, that first pair, the, the bottom left and the, the first row, second along. And th this is a really large audience, so this will be sort of difficult. But maybe, so if you're over there on that side, then maybe you can see the hexagonal sort of thing going on over here. And I'll gradually move this across, moving up and down so that everybody can try and see that hexagonal thing there. Yeah, all right. And then I'll carriage return, ka-ching. There's the square thing. So, I don't know, maybe. OK, so, so there's, a, there's a couple of, well, so there's a couple of morals here which is photographs are useless, <laughs> right? You can't even tell it's the same object. So A, you should buy my book. Um, <laughs> B, you should come and play with the stuff afterwards and, and uh, you know, 
you, you really have to play with them and see them in three dimensions because the photographs don't really help. Okay, second project. So this is a joint work with uh, Vi Hart, who many of you know, may know from YouTube, uh, and my brother, Will Segerman. And this is a project more fun than a hypercube of monkeys. Um, so to understand what this is about, um, f well, so really this is about symmetry. This is about a particular kind of symmetry that only exists in four dimensions. So, um, so I have to tell you about symmetry. So, so what is a symmetry? So, so from the sort of mathematical point of view, a symmetry is a motion of an object that leaves it looking the same after you're done. So this is a symmetrical design, and I can obviously rotate it by, say, a fifth of a turn, and it looks the same after I've done rotating it. So actually, here are, here are the five symmetries of this design here. I can rotate by one-fifth of a turn, two-fifths, three-fifths, four-fifths, or I'm also going to include the do-nothing motion. Uh, mathematicians like to include sort of trivial things that don't do anything. They're often confusing, but it sort of helps make everything fit together nicer. Um, so, so this is sort of a, a one of the, the inroads into um, algebra group theory, because these symmetries can be sort of added together. If I do the symmetry that's a fifth of a turn, and then I subsequently do the symmetry that's a further two-fifths of a turn, then the, compose, the composition of those two is the same as the three-fifths of a turn. So you can sort of add things together and get other things. Um, OK, so here's another example. How many symmetries does this have? Four? Eight? Eight. eight. Right, so, so there are, okay, so what are the symmetries? So, so it is eight. So there are the four rotations, but there's also reflections. That's a motion that leaves it looking the same. And there's four different lines that I can reflect across. So there is a total of eight symmetries on this. Okay, so now I need to tell you about monkey blocks. Um, so, and you may recognize Vi's hand here um, if you're familiar with her work. So, okay, so what is a monkey block? So this is just a cube, and I've unfolded it here. Um, it's a cube that's decorated with various designs. So um, there are two monkey paw faces of this cube. There are two monkey tail faces, and there are two monkey face faces. Uh, and you'll notice this is a left paw, and this is a right paw. So they're, they're, they're not the same. They're, they're sort of mirror images of each other. This is, a, oops, this is a question mark tail and an unquestion mark tail. And here the, the tongue is sticking out to our left or to our right. So they all have sort of a, an asymmetry in them. And you'll notice over here, opposite faces have the same design, but there's sort of a, well, there's sort of a twist. So, so to, to go from, okay, this is a very high up, but I've got my, my right monkey paw over here on the front face, and then I can, there's sort of a screw motion through it to the back, um, and there's the, the left monkey paw is actually on the, the back side here. And this thing, in fact, has no symmetry. It looks like maybe there's something you can do to move it so it looks the same, but it turns out there isn't. There's nothing you can do. So how do you fit these together so that the faces match up? That's sort of the puzzle. So here's one thing you might do. So you can make a, a, a line of monkey blocks like this. And, and by matching up, I mean that you know, a left paw has to match to a right paw, um, and they have to match up with the right rotation. So, and I can imagine this is an infinite line of blocks because I'm a mathematician and I get away with that kind of thing. Um, and so let me ask the same question. What are the symmetries of this infinite line of blocks? What are the things you can do to it so it looks the same when you're done moving it? So I can, I can sort of shift things over, right? So, so in fact, if I... Um, if I move it along, so this one is the same as this one four along. And this one here is the same as this one four along. So I can do that. There's a sort of smaller thing that I can do as well, which is a little hard to see. If I move forward one and rotate one click to the left, so I go forward and I rotate to the left, it's sort of a screw motion, then that's the same. Then that's another symmetry of this thing. So I move forward one, rotate, and that's the same. Move forward one, rotate, that's the same. And, that's the, and I was saying this sort of, you, you see the, the, the right paw and the, and the left paw are related by this sort of screw through the center. So it's, so, okay, so it's got these symmetries. I don't really actually like the shift along by four for reasons that will become clear later on. Um, I like the sort of, I like the, the, tri the twisting screw motion, so I'm gonna keep that one, but I'm gonna lose the other one by making this ring of blocks here. So this ring of four blocks 
Again, the, the faces are supposed to be glued together. Um, and again, it's got this rotate around the ring and, and twist one to the left. OK. So, so that's sort of one-dimensional stacks of these blocks. What if you try and build a wall, right? What if you try and build um, a two-dimensional plane of these? And it turns out it doesn't work. So, so, well, in the middle of this picture, there's a cube in there, and there's one above, and there's one to the right. And you would like to be able to put one over here, but it doesn't fit. There's, because you now, you, all of the blocks are the same, and they don't have the two pores next to each other. So you can't put one there. So you're sort of stuck. Um, except that, I mean, I've got a left pore here and a right pore here. Wouldn't it be great to just sort of glue them together? That would all fit very nicely. But then you would have three cubes arranged around an edge, and that's not going to work, right? I can't do that. Or can I? Yes, I can. <laughs> so the hypercube, the hypercube has three cubes around, arranged around each edge. So you can fit these together. You can fit eight of these together as the cubical faces of a hypercube, and they f all the, the decorations fit together, and it all matches up. So um, you get a hypercube, and then the next question is the same question I've been asking all along. What are the symmetries of this object? Um, it's a little bit complicated. Um, so I'm going to di digress a little, just very briefly, into quaternions and, and what's actually going on. I'll come back very quickly to pictures of monkeys. But th so the symmetries of this, there are eight symmetries, and they correspond to the eight elements of something called the quaternion group. So, um, so people may be familiar with complex numbers. So complex numbers like real numbers, but you've got an extra number, i, whose square is negative 1. So the quaternions are sort of a souped-up version of the, the complex numbers, where you have three extra numbers, i, j, and k. Um, and they, they are, in fact, all squared and negative 1, and they have some other relations between them. And so there's a correspondence between these eight elements in this eight-element quaternion group and the symmetries of this thing. So one is the do-nothing motion. i, j, and k are these, these screw motions I've been talking about. So here's a ring of four around here, and you can move forward one and click and rotate. And simultaneously, you sort of have this other ring of four, which are going the other direction, and you move forward one and rotate. Uh, the negatives of those are the reverse screw motions, and minus one sends every cube to its opposite. Um, it's antipodal. And it turns out that these motions satisfy the same uh, defining equations, the same equations as the defining equations of the quaternions. So i squared and j squared and k squared are negative one, and also i, j, k is negative one. So, so the, the symmetries of this decorated hypercube are this group, this 8 mln quaternion group. And somehow the point of why we're interested in this is this group doesn't exist as the symmetries of three-dimensional objects. You can only do it in four dimensions. And so, so this was the, the idea. I want to make an object that has this symmetry that doesn't exist. Well, it doesn't exist in three dimensions, but I can somehow project down from four dimensions. So how do I make a sculpture that has this crazy symmetry? Um, well, so each monkey block has no symmetry itself, I mentioned before. Or, well, rather, it has only the do-nothing symmetry. Um, so in order to make a sculpture, I have to put some sort of design inside of this cube, and the design can have no symmetry. If the design itself had symmetry, then the whole object would have too much symmetry. It wouldn't be showing the thing that I want to show. And so um, there's really only one choice. It has to be a monkey. Uh, this is, and I'm actually kind of serious, is, this is almost canonical. So, okay, so it has to be a design with no symmetry. I'm a mathematician, mathematical artist, what am I going to do? Everything I do has symmetry. Okay, some, some sort of figurative thing, because figurative things have no symmetry. Okay, and I need some kind of figure which has enough limbs that it will connect onto its neighbors in the other cubes. So this monkey is connected onto its six neighboring monkeys in the other cubes, so it has to be sort of happy being kind of flexible, right? It's got to have a leg sticking out of the, the face behind it and behind and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, I mean, maybe you could do a cat, but this is basically it. Monkeys have tails and heads, so you add up to six limbs and everything works out. OK, so then we just do exactly the same thing, right? You've got these monkeys inside of these cubes on the hypercube, radially project them onto the sphere in four-dimensional space, stereographically project down into three-dimensional space, and this is what you get. Um, and it's kind of Dali-esque, and some people find it a little disturbing, but whatever. <laughs> um, OK, so this is what happens if you do it with a hypercube. I'll come back to that web page in a second. There are these other shapes, the 24 cell. This is what happens if you do it with the 24 cell. There are 20, this is more fun than a 24 cell of monkeys. There are 24 monkeys in here. 
Spider-Man. And this is, this is what happens when you do it with 120 cell, 120 monkeys. Actually, this is only the, the 75 monkeys in the southern hyperhemisphere, including the hyper equator of, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's go to this website. What is monkeys.hypernom.com? So this is an animated virtual reality version of the same thing. And this is showing the animation, right? So, oh, sorry, this is showing the symmetry. So every few seconds, this lighter colored monkey is going to turn into this one. And that's sort of gradually showing that symmetry. Every few seconds, you're going to move along and it's going to click forward one. Um, and at the same time, there's these uh, darker color monkeys that are m rotating in the other direction through this, uh, this other ring. Um, and there's this sort of interesting thing. So the, uh, the darker mon colored monkeys actually go through infinity, which means they get very big. And every so often, you're, you're visited by the monkey god who says hello and then comes back down again to become a mere mortal. Um, so if I press a button, this is the 24 cell monkeys. Now you get this ring of six, um, six lighter colored monkeys. There are in fact four rings of these, uh, these monkeys. Um, you may be aware the 24 cell is self-dual. Uh, what that means is you can fit another 24 monkeys in between the gaps left by the first 24 monkeys. So now I've got 48 monkeys there, That's uh, fitting them in. And this is the full 120 uh, monkeys. And you get this entire cosmology of monkeys. Um, so there's the ring of, there's this ring of uh, 10 lighter colored monkeys. And then dual to that, there's a ring of 10 darker colored monkeys and various colors. Incidentally, this, these 10 monkeys are exactly the same as the ring of 10 dodecahedra from the puzzles. It's exactly the same. So you can go to monkeys.hypernom.com on your laptop and play about with this. Um, I'm almost done, this, but there's one more thing I want to show you. So, ju but just before I do that, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, 3dprintmath.com is the website for the book. Uh, I do a lot of YouTube videos. Shapeways um, prints all of my stuff, and you can get hold of things there. And thingiverse.com, you can download the 3D files for a lot of my things. OK, so there's one more thing I want to show you. Um, What's that? Hypernom.com. So this is actually an interactive thing. If you have your phone on you, um, then you can turn it on and go to hypernom.com. And let's see. Um, and if you do that, then hopefully you will see this. So just go there on your phone. You may need to lock the orientation of, of it. And, uh, and it says touch the start. So I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to touch the, the second row third along, this sort of Pentagon thing. And if I do that, I see this. And what you'll notice is, I mean, this is just what's on screen, is that as I move my uh, iPad around, or your phone if you've got this on your phone, somehow you're moving through the space in a kind of confusing way. Um, and you'll see what's on screen is yet again the 120 cell, um, or the, the dodecahedral cells of the 120 cell. And so just a sort of, sort of one idea of how to navigate this space. If you sort of uh, look in a particular direction and you sort of turn the steering wheel to the right, you seem to go forwards. And when you get close enough to one of these dodecahedra, they disappear. So this is you eating it. So it's sort of four-dimensional Pac-Man. So the name is hypernom, hyper as in hypersphere, and nom as in nom nom nom, the eating sound. So the, so the idea is you have to eat all of the cells of the 120 cell. Um, and... Uh, so, so, OK, what's the math behind this? I'll very briefly say what's going on here. So there's no, there's no you know, you're not touching the screen. You're just rotating it. So the set of possible orientations of the iPad, um, well, there's, there's a, it's a compact set. Um, you can describe it using matrices if you like. It's SO3. Um, and sort of as a, as a manifold, as a three-dimensional manifold, that's the same as RP3, which is double covered by S3, the sphere in four-dimensional space. What all that means is that you can, you can use the orientation of the iPad as a way to navigate the sphere in four-dimensional space. And so, um, so by moving this thing around, you're actually navigating through the sphere and trying to collect all of these things. I'm just going to reset this for a second to show you one more thing. So I'll just touch it, and I go back to the menu screen, uh, and then I go back to um, this one again. So it's reset. I've got all of the, all of the dodecahedra again. So there's a sort of a double cover thing going on here. Some of you maybe may have heard of the Dirac belt trick, and it's the same sort of thing. So if I rotate this half a turn, 
a full turn, you can see I'm not back where I started, right? Because I've still got dodecahedra in front of me. But if I go another half turn and then a full turn, now I've tunneled my way through um, an entire circle's worth of the, of the, the 120 cell, and then I've gone through the entire, I've, I've gone through a, along a great circle inside of the, the sphere in four dimensional space. So this is somehow showing you or seeing, seeing that, um, that double color. One last uh, thought on this, and then I'll finish. So, um, so in order to win this, you have to get to every orientation twice because of this double cover thing. And this was not originally developed for um, uh, phones. This was originally developed for virtual reality headsets. So, it, oh yeah, sure, fine, you can do it like this. But can you do it when it's strapped to your face? <laughs> so, so this is how you have to win the game. And you're being timed as well, so it'll, if you win, it'll show you how long you took. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you very much.